Hello and welcome to the video. This is a video showing you how I built out my T2 Cruiser here from Heewing. This is not a small model and there was loads of great questions about this. Now I have built it out ready for the maiden flight, just waiting for the weather to break here. The best part of being doing this stuff in winter means that you have to wait for the weather to be half decent where you can get a flying buddy to do the hat cam stuff for you. But it has gone together pretty easy. There is a lot of space inside here. So in terms of fitting all the electronics in, I haven't really had to fight it. So what I thought it'd be fun to do would be to actually show you how it's all gone together because um, there's loads of room. You really don't have to do things like I had to do with that um, VCI Dove, for example, where there was no room at all. Um, I've done a couple of different things though. So I will give you a, a bit of a view inside. It's also an opportunity because I'm using a SpeedyB F405 wing flight controller for me to show you what that looks like as well and show you how I've set that up. Lots of you have asked me to do a quick setup video for that. So a big chunk of this video is actually gonna be showing you how I've put all that together. Walk snail in the nose as well. And I am using a pretty chunky battery in this. This is a 3000 milliamp hour battery in the nose. It weighs just over 500 grams, making the all up weight for the whole thing as it is sat in my hand right now, 1,909 grams. And I'm not sure you can make it that much lighter than that. So let me get into the weeds, show you how all the electronics have gone together and where I've put everything and how I've made it so that we're ready for a maiden. So let me show you how I've set up this Speedy Bee F405 wing flight controller to go into the T2 Cruiser. Now I've set this up, it's got the connectors on it so I can move it from plane to plane as I'm reviewing and setting things up. The only difference would have been if I was doing this for real, rather than have this flying lead that's going to plug into the lead that's already there on the power distribution board, uh, that would actually go directly to it. So these are the two power connectors. That's gonna plug into the battery rather than the battery connection that's already in there. And the battery connector that's already in there is gonna plug into here. So the power's gonna come in and go out over those two cables. This thing here, this is the USB connector. It also has the buzzer, the boot button, and the little switch to turn the buzzer on and off. Uh, that is where we plug it into the computer. That needs to be connected all the time, particularly if you're gonna activate the buzzer, which I am doing here. Then we have the GPS and compass unit. The GPS and compass is plugged into one of the ports at the end. We'll look a little bit more closely at the ports. Um, this is a really great little setup because the way the cable comes in the box with the flight controller, it's got the right connectors. So you can ju just kind of push them into the connector that comes with the GPS itself. So I've connected up both the GPS and the compass. So the DA and CL or the data and clock lines on here are connected to the serial clock and serial data lines at the other end. So the six cables beneath, between the two. So I've taken the unusual step is I have also activated the compass in iNav. That does mean we're gonna have to make sure that the little arrow that's on the front of this is gonna be pointing towards, towards the nose of the aircraft. Uh, the other things that are here, now it's really designed for a CRSF, star receiver, something like Crossfire, Tracer, or Express LRS, probably gonna be the majority these days, to go onto these four pins here. If you go onto the computer, you can actually see that's exactly what they show here. You can use it with SBUS, as I'm doing here. I'm using up my old receivers, and this is the SBUS connection going into this connector. Sadly, smart port won't work on these connections. Smart port does need, I think, an inverted signal. Uh, this will not do that. So just be aware of that if you're looking at this SpeedyBeat F405 wing um, you're going to need the smart port on inverted hack or you're just going to have to use something like an express LRS receiver to get the telemetry down easily last thing is this cable here this looks a bit, a bit complicated but it's not this port here is the one that is for the HD FPV system and I've split it into two parts this is ultimately going into a little cable that's going to fit in the side of the walk snow unit uh, one part is a JST power connector that's done that way so that the last thing I do before I fly is I plug it in that means it's not sat there getting hot and the other two cables coming out of here are for the transmit and receive pins that are going to go into the walk snow unit and give me my on-screen display so that means if we zoom in a little bit and look at the end 
of how this flight controller is set up. You kind of get cables. There are pads that you can connect to as well, but the cables are a really neat way of doing it, particularly if you can kind of repin stuff like this and make the cable up to be exactly what you want. So the top four connections are just for the LEDs um, that come as part of the kit. The bottom four then, you have this one on the bottom, which is for the HD system. I've only got four of the pins connected. That's a nine volt and ground, the um, transmit and receive pins. I have removed the S plus and ground pin because that's typically only used with the GGI stuff and I'm not using a GGI piece of equipment here. And then the next big connector, and again, you get the cable in the kit. This one is for the GPS and compass. This has the power and ground in the middle. And then one side, the blue and the green wires in this case are for my compass. The white and the yellow wire are for the receive and transmit to get the GPS coordinate stuff down. The other two connectors here that I'm not using are for analog FPV. One is for the camera and one is for the VTX. Now the actual wiring itself is very clearly shown on the manual. They've done a lovely job of showing how all this goes together. However, they are absolutely showing it with just an SBUS receiver or an ELRS or Crossfire receiver. There's nothing on here about the smart port telemetry. I know that's less of a used thing now, but if you're like me and you're using up the old free sky stuff where you can, uh, that's a little bit of a shame. It's also an issue with things like the flight controllers, the Atom RC ship as well. It's something that they don't support either. Now, all of the cool stuff that you can do with this with iNav is also available via the SpeedyB app. I have checked that there's no short so I can power everything, but let me just plug it in very briefly into the computer and show you how I've got the ports and everything configured and I've got it all working. So let's plug it in. Wait for it to boot. And then here on the computer we'll click connect. So the reason it's moving around a little bit is that is the compass. As I move the compass, the plane will move. It's not as easy as that because the, the compass and the flight controller need to be the same orientation. I'll almost certainly, when I put it in the model, have to rotate this by 90 degrees because at the moment when I lift the front up, the, front, the model lifts here, you can see that. Um, ideally, I want it side to side because of the slightly cramped nature, weirdly, that uh, He-Wing have left us with to put the flight controller in, but we'll look at that in a moment. As you can see here on the top, we have a GPS and the barometer, the magnetometer is turned on, accelerator and gyro. So I went through the calibration, not only for the flight controller itself, also did the compass calibration. The mixer I've got set up as a standard plane. So we have um, the aileron is twice, but we only need one of those. I could delete them, but at the moment there's loads of outputs on this. I'm not too worried. I would need to add the flaps in, probably on a channel from the radio, uh, but that's how it's laid out. In terms of the outputs, well, the outputs aren't configured yet. Uh, I'm gonna have to calibrate the ESCs. I've increased the servo refresh rate to 100 Hertz. These are digital servos, so it should handle that easily. Ports is one of those tabs that needs a bit of looking at. Uh, UART1 is where I tried to use a smart port. That didn't work at all. So unfortunately, smart port isn't something that's going to work. Uh, if you're going to use SBUS, then you need to turn on serial receiver as UART2. If you're using CRSF or something else, you'd have serial receiver put on UART1. GPS is UART3, that's that port on the back that's dedicated for it. And then UART5, which is set for MSP display port, is where my HD FPV system is plugging in. The rest of it is pretty standard stuff. I did set the magnetometer to auto, and when it booted, it found the external 5883 compass that's part of the GPS compass unit. I've turned on permanently enable launch mode, I've turned on things like continuously trim servos, I set the fail safe to return to home and set my modes up as I normally do and my on-screen display has been configured for the walk snail system. So this is all pretty standard stuff at the moment. The only thing I probably need to do, and we can try it here on the bench, 
is to make it so that the front of this flight controller is not over here, it's going to be to the side, and then I can put it in side to side. Now what I need to do there is in the configuration tab, I need to change the board and sensor alignment. So for this, if I put 90 degrees and say save and reboot, and we go back into setup, what we should see is that as I, this bit here, this is now the front of the model, which is probably how I'm gonna want it. So this will now be the front, so I can mount it side to side. I've put foam mounting strips on the bottom of this. I've put them on the back of things like the little USB connector too. So let me show you how this all now goes into the model. So there was a couple of adaptations I've done in terms of the nose, the servos for the flaps and some other pieces too in order to fit everything. Now to get the Walksdale unit into the nose, I designed and 3D printed this piece. I'll put a link down below to my uh, thing on Thingiverse. This is gonna glue into the side like this and then it'll slide into position. It's behind one of the air holes. And the other thing I've done is I have turned the top of the nose here into an exhaust for air. There's not enough airflow in the front of here. Let's see how warm this is all going to get. But this does mean the Watts Nail unit is going to be easy to get in and take out. And that cable that I've just been showing you on the table can actually just plug into the back. And that should make it pretty straightforward and easy. Adding the flap servos wasn't super simple and there wasn't a manual when I did it here. So I kind of had to figure it out. This is the second one I've done. Uh, that is an issue with the flap servos in my humble opinion. They've just flipped the wing design uh, and they should have kept the orientation of the servos the same for the flap, so you only need one channel. It's a bit of a mistake, you need two channels for the flaps, that's going to make it more complicated. I'm using good old Yoohoo pour glue, putting a bit where the servo is going to go and also putting a little bit in where the servo horn is going to go. The trick is to put the control rod the servo horn onto the servo and then feed it through and then push everything down into position and then let the glue go off. Trying to do it with putting the servo in first, you don't then have enough kind of room to get the control horn on and the con everything else. It's just a pain in the butt. If you do it this way, you'll be in with a chance. Again, not a massive fan of the way the flaps are installed and set up on this thing. If they'd have kept the server orientation the same on both sides, it would have meant we could have just used one channel. And having everything hidden away with a solid fixed length like this also means that we haven't got the ability to kind of tweak things by adjusting the linkages either. So let me jump onto the bench and give you a much closer view of how things like the flight controller, GPS, and other pieces have gone inside. I suppose it makes sense to start here at the nose and work backwards. I have taken one of the wings off just so I can fit the thing on the bench. This is a rather large wingspan and it's quite an unwieldy thing with the tail on as well. So at the front, uh, I haven't yet screwed it in, but we have that Wax nail setup that is just plugged into those two cables. That also means it's easy to get and change as well. Last thing I do need to do is just put the two screws either side here of these wooden pieces just to make sure that that is in place. Again, that is the air vent at the top to try and keep everything cool. This is the battery. Battery is 505 grams, 6S. I would have loved it to have been something like a 8S setup. Again, I'm gonna talk about it in a moment, but the things like the flight controllers back here only kind of work up to 6S. So I kind of understand that a little bit. This is the power cable. So this is where I would plug in the walk snow unit as the very last thing before I go and fly. Behind here then, we have quite a bit of space. If I just move this forward a little bit so you can kind of see better. What we have here is we have the flight controller. The flight controller is mounted sideways, just as I said, I showed in the video. I've actually done it that way. You can mount it front to back, however, it is tight and these carbon spars that go through, unfortunately, mean that it gets a little bit tricky to say the least. So I've 
mounted it like this. I would have preferred the, the spars to be slightly further apart for the wing and for the mounting point on here to easily take something like a wing style controller like this front to back so that wasn't needed. ESCs on this quite nicely are D-shot capable. So I've set that up so I haven't had to do any of the calibration stuff. Using the old receiver. So I've um, got the two receivers. I've cut two little squares out the back so they're in there and the GPS is mounted here making sure of course that the little arrow is facing forward. So that is how it's all fit. Now with the battery in this position I have got perfect central gravity and this again is a 505 gram battery. Overall weight of this thing in flying condition is 1909 grams. If I had bigger batteries, and I've been trying a couple in here just to see how the weights all work, having something like an 800 odd gram battery would still work, but it has to sit back here towards the flight controller. There is a little bit of room under the flight controller because the central gravity is kind of here-ish. So if you had a real big battery, it would have to be wide and relatively flat to be able to slide underneath here. So I'm not sure I could have built this any lighter than it is, but although it's nearly two kilograms in weight, it seems to feel like it wants to fly when you just hold it in a little bit of wind. So I'm excited to see how that's going to work. The only other thing to mention is that I have balanced the props. Uh, these are relatively decent sized props. So these are kind of eight inch jobs. I would recommend doing that. It just makes sure that the vibration, particularly on larger models, you tend to get a little bit more vibration in places when you're using these lower KV units. So that's how it all is. Again, there is tons of space in here, but actually with a big battery in it and with all the different pieces, it's disappeared quite quickly. So there you have it, that's how, it's how it has gone together. Again, flying weight for this is 1,909 grams with a 500 gram battery. It would take, I reckon, up to 800 grams in this nose area without breaking a sweat, really. I uh, wish I had more 6S batteries, and that's one of my criticisms with this, is that going 6S means I've been trying to find two large old 3S batteries from when I used to fly a lot of 3S planes. I haven't really got all those anymore. They've all been retired and discharged and recycled. Having two 4S batteries might have worked. However, things like modern flight controllers like the Speedy B F405 wing wouldn't support 8S. So we'd have to do some shenanigans there. So join me when I get this thing in the air and we actually take it for a fly. I've got my fingers crossed the weather breaks soon. Thank you for watching the video. If you watch my videos and find them useful, then please take a moment to hit the like and subscribe button. It helps the channel a lot. If you really like what I'm doing here, you can become a Patreon and support the time I spend helping others and get access to lots of exclusive benefits. Link is in the video description. Remember that all the videos on the channel are organized into playlists, so you can easily use those playlists to find all the videos on a subject that you are interested in. Add Painless360 to your searches on Google and YouTube, and it'll help you find my content for any particular topic. Thanks again for watching, and as always, happy flying.